Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I am the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. Today, Kelly will interview Chief Data Scientist Narasima Adala to discuss the role of a data scientist. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DI Analytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management. Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implementing EIM solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelly to introduce today's guest speaker and to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. Good morning, good afternoon, and if anyone is in uh, Europe, good evening. So. Today joining me is Narasimha Adala. Narasimha is the Chief Data Scientist with Databloom.com. And before co-founding Databloom in 2016, Narasimha was a solution architect at Intel building high volume manufacturing control systems. Prior to that, he worked as a consulting research scientist with Reed Elsevier Incorporated building petascale, massively parallel processing information extraction systems. Narasimha holds a master's degree in human factors engineering from Wright State University and an ABD status in data mining also from Wright State University. So welcome Narasimha, very happy to have you with us today. Thank you Kelly, it is my privilege. Great, well so we have a few um, uh, questions that we've put together that we thought would be a great way to get this webinar started. And then we would love to hear your questions. So as Shannon mentioned in the Q&A part of your screen, the goal is to have this be an open interview and have your questions get answered. Uh, so we're going to start off with some very foundational questions around what does a data scientist do? What skills are needed? What training is needed? And then my current favorite, which I realized is a terribly crafted grammatical question, who do data scientists report to? I am just imagining my English teacher, Mrs. Clark, uh, screaming at me for ending a sentence with a preposition. Anyway, to whom do data scientists report? And of course, anything else that you want to bring up. So without further ado, why don't we just get started? So Narasimha, in your experience, what does a data scientist do? Ah, <laughs> good morning, folks. Um, so data scientists draw actionable insights from data. And that's what, you know, the, the, uh, the accepted definition in the industry is. But what do we really mean by that? You know, and, and um, you know, of course, everybody draws actionable insights from data. And that's what data is supposed to do for us. Um, and so what I wanted to do to kind of introduce you to as to what we do, uh, I wanted to kind of give you an anecdotal story as to how I serendipitously walked into data science. So I used to work as a research scientist with Reed and Sevier, um, like you rightly introduced. I was building massively parallel processing systems to actually index content and make it searchable uh, for lawyers and academic folks so they can actually research and, and do this great stuff. Now in 2011, a company called Manta Media um, actually hired me out from Dayton to Columbus to be their chief data scientist. Now, mind you, I had actually worked as a research scientist and I was applying for quote unquote a research science job with Manta Media. And I had gone to the interview at AS State, of course I knew what I was talking about. And so they immediately called me back and said, you know, hey, we're gonna actually make you chief data scientist. Um, and to be very candid and honest with you, I had no idea what a data scientist was. Or <laughs> I had never heard about data science. And so I was really upset. I thought this was a one way how I'm being, my, at least my skills are being underrated, if you will. 
And so I, I have a very good friend in Mountain View, California, right? And, and we all know him. And he's called Google. So I duly actually searched <laughs> right. on Google. Right. Don't we love Google? <laughs> <laughs> my best friend, I'll tell you. I spend uh, a good 50% of my time every day with him. Um, so I, I, I searched and actually encountered on this article that uh, Dr. Tom Davenport had written about how data scientist was the sexiest uh, career uh, profession of the 21st century. And I think what it led me to believe was that, you know, data scientists dive in their neck deep into the data and draw insights that are really solving business challenges. Um, so, so somehow, at least the key takeaway that I had, and I, I believe at least my management that hired me at Manta Media had, was that, you know, we were this unicorn clan that was day in, day out breathing data, if you will, in order to find this golden nugget that will really advance business prospects forward. It was an awesome deal, but frankly, I had no idea what I was doing. So for the first three months, I, I wanted to fake it till I made it, hoping that something would actually click in my head as to what a data scientist really does, even as I was focused on quote-unquote research science. But the long story is three months later, uh, I, was, I was still pretending, right? I mean, I was still pretending I was faking till I made it. Uh, but three months later, I think one business problem came about. By the way, in these three months, I hadn't really solved any business challenge per se. And so, and so in three months later, one of the business problems that our chief technology officer posed at me, he said, you know, Narsimha, do me a favor. What we have, by the way, Manta Media is an online small business listings company. They source information from secretaries of state for all the business listings and make web pages available for this business contact information. So, so small and medium businesses have a web representation, if you will. Uh, long story, we, we actually source that information, this business listings information, the 75 million businesses in the U.S. and worldwide, for example, that we had information for, from Dun & Bradstreet, from Secretaries of State, and we pay huge money for it. Um, but what was happening was all of our information was being stolen, stolen by pirates that actually came through underground networks. Uh, and stole this information and made a black market out of it. And obviously this was not good health prospect for our business. And so he said, you know, hey, uh, Narasimha, can you, can you help me? And I had no idea. So, but he gave me the web logs, right? He told me, you know, hey, here are the kind of patterns that we're actually seeing. Uh, we have about 30 million visitors a day. You know, can you tell us who are the rogues out of this and who are really genuine customers that are soliciting or seeking business information? I sat through it, and, and, and immediately what became apparent was uh, how these underground networks were actually uh, uh, being leveraged for uh, crawling this information and stealing it, how there were directed patterns versus undirected patterns, you know, because we as humans usually use hyperlink structure. We read the content. We space out of requests of crawls and so on and so forth. But the point I'm trying to get across is after three months, I had this eureka moment saying, ah, now I've solved the problem. I can tell who is really a pirate user that is stealing our information from a genuine customer that is really soliciting small and medium business listing services, if you will. And so when I solved that problem, it gave me a tremendous amount of satisfaction. That for the first time told me something. I'm sorry for a very long verbose story here, but the point I'm trying to get across here is we draw insights from the data, but we, we don't do undirected searches. Maybe it was my misunderstanding of reading Tom Davenport's article on Harvard Business Review that we are this unicorn clan that is trying to forge new business models, new discoveries. That wasn't the case. They're all purposefully driven business problems that currently need solving, but do not have the wherewithal, the skills, the bandwidth to actually solve them. Data scientists really dig into these big data structures, if you will, to actually find the patterns of solving those problems. Uh, so the very meaningful, applied, purposeful investigation that seeks, seeks to explore insights from the data. That's really interesting, Narasimha, because I do think that there's a bit of a misperception, or maybe it's my own misperception, that data science is somehow this magical thing where the data reveals itself, as opposed to, like you said, purposeful investigation. Anyway, I think that's really interesting, so thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So I, I, what I also additionally wanted to do, Kelly, is um, kind of illustrate the use cases, a recent set of use cases perhaps, that try and define, uh, you know, what as a data scientist at least I have worked on. Uh, I, and the intent of doing that is not just, of course, bragging, you know, we all would like to brag, 
Uh, but more importantly, I think there's a genius. It's okay, Narasimha, you're on the interview to brag. Go for <laughs> it. <laughs> we want to hear. We want to hear you. what you do. <laughs> So, so also, I think the other intent is obviously there's questions on you know how is this different than research scientist, um, how is this different than say a data analyst that actually lives and reads the same data, um, and hopefully the use cases will make it distinct. If not, at least I do have some explicitly stated statements uh, that will try to draw the distinction between the three personas. If you don't mind advancing to the next slide, Kelly. Perfect. So I will actually not speak to this slide right now. I will come back to it. But the three use cases that I really, really wanted to highlight was, um, so Read Elsevier is an online information listings company. So what we do is crawl information, um, legal information, business information, financial information, and so on, and make it indexed and searchable for lawyers, you know, academic researchers, and you know, tax professionals, health professionals, and so on, to actually come to our, our website and be able to do research. So think about you know how you and I have the best friend of Google day in day out. The lawyers, the scientific researchers actually use Read Elsevier quite extensively uh, for their research. So one of the problems that was posed to us back in 2009, 2010-ish time frame was, um, you know, hey, how come our royalty rates? You know, obviously we have to pay for this content. It's not like we simply crawl and uh, fleece the copyrighted material for commercial purposes. Uh, we have to pay these royalty rates for every um, uh, link that we present to our, our, our customers and consumers. We have to pay royalty rates back to the suppliers, you know, the content suppliers and publishers. It turns out in 2010, it, again, a question was posed as to why our royalty rates were as high as they were. Turns out when we actually looked into the data, the web logs, the dwell times, and so on, of each of this content and our search results, what happened was we were actually surfacing. So, for, I don't know how many of you know there's a there's a um, there's a consortium basically, and you have Associated Press or Reuters, for example. They're republishers. They actually compile material from other people and actually republish this content. Um, so the, lo the long story is, Read Elsevier was actually soliciting information from multiple sources for the same content, and we were actually paying double and triple royalty rates than what we we're ideally serving the customer. So if we wow. say showed Article One, you know that ha that was titled the same way, you know that was written by the same person, but sourced through Factiva versus sourced through Reuters versus sourced through Associated Press, let's just say, we would literally pay the royalty to all the three publishers, even though we only surfaced content from one of those three sources. So that's what really interesting, and and I think that some of the folks on the phone could probably uh, relate to that because we all buy data, right? So whether mm -hmm. it's you know, Dun and Bradstreet or what have you, and in these, you know, large organizations, it's not always clear whether we are buying it once or multiple times. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and for a for a research firm that's at least three petabytes in content, you can imagine how much of royalty rate savings we could actually have achieved had we had a deduplication module in place. So as a research scientist, I shouldn't call that as a data scientist, but we wouldn't have known that we were actually you know, having these leaks in the content royalty rates, had we not had the data at our disposal to study the web log patterns, the analytical patterns of the dwell times and so on, um, to optimize and reduce all of this leakage that we had going on. Um, so a second use case, for example, is, um, you know, at uh, the high value manufacturing company that I worked for, uh, we do what is called as layout sensitive defect analysis. Um, that's just, a very uh, a very complex term describing what is very simple otherwise. So all of we we make circuits, right? Circuits that connect, you know, wires that connect point A to point B. And when you actually are match, making this complex circuit on a on a on a wafer and a die, um, mistakes happen, you know, because uh, mistakes happen one because uh, we are operating at such nano scales, if you will. Uh, but more importantly, you know, other mistakes also happen, you know, with respect to, you know, just the environmental factors, if you will, that exist. And so when this, uh, when this circuit really fails in the field, we have an obligation to actually root cause exactly what happened wrong. Is that because of a dry edge? Is that of a, because of a cross connect that happened between two circuit patterns that are not supposed to connect with each other and so on? So one of the things that we actually do, or we did, is we would actually put this under a scanning electron microscope and take pictures, if you will, of the circuits to see what in fact went wrong. And this is obviously, you can imagine, a very manual, laborious process that takes days and weeks, frankly, for us to do. 
Obviously, when multitude of these things happen, you don't want to do every one of them, but you want some automated way to actually coalesce these kinds of problems into groups. So you can actually dispense an entire uh, diagnostic group uh, through one fault analysis correlation versus you know doing multiple investigations, if you will. And so we had actually applied, quote unquote, we had learned about this deep learning you know, how we can actually use convolutional neural networks to actually do some of this automated image analysis. But the long story is, we were able to actually take these big lots of circuits, if you will, and group them into these diagnostic groups that we could dispense away uh, our, our, uh, our magicians, our real magicians, if you will, to root cause these groups versus individual units. And that was a huge deal as far as, the, you know, I was concerned. Um, Similarly, there's a third use case, for example, where, um, and, 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 and stop me, by the way, uh, this is the last use case I'll go through. Hopefully no, that's good, that's good. And then we've got a question that I wanted to add in. So when you're done with this use case, I'm gonna take a question from the, from the um, participants. Perfect, perfect. So the third use case, for example, is uh, there's a rental car company uh, that operates in the US and has the challenges of fleet management. Um, you know, when I say fleet management, you know, how many cars do you hold on the parking lot? So, you know, you're never really turning away a customer that rightfully deserves or, or is willing to pay the dime to rent the car. And what we, when we dug into the data, it, it, you know, it always seemed like, you know, Phoenix, for example, one good example here is in the Phoenix airport, it's extremely hot for those that don't know the Phoenix, um, yeah, you know, environmental conditions. Uh, in summer, we were seeing, seeing approximately 100,000 less cars rented versus the usual moving average of Phoenix, okay? And then we could also see, for example, as to what class was being under-rented versus what class was in fact being oversubscribed in other times and so on and so forth. So one of the things that we also found out, so obviously the rental car company had a problem at their disposal, you know, where they were scratching their head and saying, how do we maximize the utilization of a fleet, if you will? And so when we, you know, we can typically apply the temporal patterns of analysis to see the supply demand patterns and so on. But what we'd also done was took a, took a, uh, a holistic geotemporal view to also have a Eureka moment where Los Angeles, for example, was renting 300,000 cars more during the same time frame that Phoenix was actually exhibiting uh, a slump. And so now we knew, you know, how to do this mixed modeling in order to maximize the profits for, uh, you know, by doing proper fleet management for this rental car company. Now, um, so these are the kind of use cases the data scientists actually deal with, you know, where they have a stated business problem that is absolutely necessary, we're not magicians. And we dig into the data, we look for the patterns, if you will, into this data and look to solve these challenges, typically by doing what if analysis, okay? And that gets me to the first talking point on this slide, mm -hmm. which is, Typically, people start to answer what and how questions. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about business analysts, you talk about business intelligence solutions that we build today. They're almost always looking to see how we performed last month, last year, what went wrong, you know, and so on. But what data scientists really try to do is answer the preemptive questions, which is they ask why. The first trait of a data scientist is they're not caught up between the what and how answer, but rather they're asking why and they're also asking, what if? Meaning they're challenged and willing to challenge the status quo and emulate or simulate these scenarios as they play out and are able to drive actionable strategies um, that they can now then recommend to the business to actually drive towards. So they're actually in that sense formulating new business models, not so much from the fact that they're just staring at the data for long, long times, which I was led to believe initially as I was reading it through my misconceived eyes of Harvard uh, Business Review Law Journal that he was uh, <laughs> right. business journal that uh, Tom Davenport was referring to. So that, that is in a sense the difference between the research uh, the BI analyst, the data analyst, and the data scientist. Data scientist is willing to ask the why and the what if questions. Um, uh, the other difference that I think from a research science perspective where I was focused so much on the CRISP DM process, you know, when I was with LexisNexis or doing traditional statistical data mining, um, I don't know how many of you are aware of CRISP-DM industry standard process, but basically it's about collecting data, formulating a hypothesis, you know, evaluating the data if it's the hypothesis or not and dispensing it and so on. But the other distinction that the data scientist has beyond the research scientist is they use the same principles, but they are actually now dealing with big data 
data that's happening in real world. This is not controlled data that has been pre-canned, if you will, for postulated for a real problem, but rather this data is happening in near real time at a very high velocity in a variety of uh, data structures as it's happening. And so what we have the responsibility to do is actually collate some of these hypotheses that we're trying to apply, not in the controlled lab setting, but rather on this live data as it's happening. And we're able to actually see through all of this through Lean Six Sigma principles, you know, whether it's value, agility, you know, uh, engagement kind of imperatives that the Six Sigma principles really preach to us, the data scientists are actually able to apply the traditional research science hy hypotheses or methodologies in the big data context with a very clearly purposefully driven uh, business uh, process and value insight. So right. at the bottom, by the way, I've listed a bunch of use cases. These are just exemplary, if you will. There are tons of other use cases that we'll come across as we actually go through the interview process, hopefully, Kelly. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's take a couple of questions while we're on this topic. So the first one is, uh, would you consider operations research analysts to be data scientists? So this comes from a woman who works for the federal agency that was identified in Tom Davenport's Competing on Analytics as the first non-defense application of analytics. She says, we have economists, st economists, statisticians, and or analysts. They all perform analytics, but they don't have the title data scientist. Mm -hmm. So again, would you consider operations research analysts to be data scientists? I, I, I think so, absolutely. I mean, um, <clears throat> they are. And, uh, you know, I, I believe it used to be called decision science before uh, in the operations research domain. Uh, we're calling them data science right, right now. But but I, I think one, one clear distinction, even if it is a subtle distinction to be made is, you know, it's not necessarily an optimization routine, as you will actually see in the top mm -hmm. left uh, graphic, is that you're not just doing the traditional BI descriptive analytics or diagnostic analytics or even uh, you know operation research of optimizations you know your your you know your warehouse management and your supply demand matchmaking if you will mm -hmm. but you're also able to actually do some preemptive analytics and that do not necessarily mean operations research alone so we're not necessarily walking towards that that taguchi uh, uh, optimization uh, optimal point mm -hmm. of dispensing but we're able to also formulate some data strategies beyond uh, beyond uh, the business strategies as well Got it, got it. So then it's really the way that those operations research people behave and how far they get into the why and the what if. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, great. So another question from the audience. So how much of the data that is gathered is already structured? Is there a significant amount of time spent cleaning, labeling the data sets so that they are suitable to train machine learning? Uh, someone who's asked that question actually knows what they're talking about, you know, to be very honest with you, because... <laughs> very good. We do have an experienced audience here, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> so, data scientists actually, uh, you know, it, it, I kind of address this in the forward slides, but in any case, you know, let me give it up right now, that it's not really the modeling that's so challenging. You know, every everyone basically develops that instinct as they go along in this practice of which statistical model to apply, you know, what kind of analysis to apply and what kind of quantitative metrics do we use to actually measure the analysis. That's not the challenging piece, frankly. Initially, it might seem like it, you know, I guess um, it's like driving, you know, we initially remember every little physical movement we have to do, the motor uh, skills that we have to develop. But I think once you really become good at it, it becomes muscle memory. So it's very similar in data science, it's not the modeling that's very challenging, it becomes muscle memory, but the data preparation never comes in a nicely formatted data frame format, you know, that you can simply apply a matrix model to, for example. Right. And say, hey, here is my regression equation. It never comes in that form. 80 to 90% of the time, frankly, goes into simply collecting, curating, shaping, imputing, exploring this data set into a form that's then actually manageable. Wow, uh, 80 to 90%. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. And that's, in fact, why we are the unicorns, right? I mean, it, it's very hard to actually master that particular skill. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and that mastery is what really comes with a lot of experience, if you will. And that, mm -hmm. that persistence and patience to actually go through the trigger of data preparation is why, in fact, data scientists get paid a higher dime uh, than usually the rest of the professions. Usually, by the way. Right. Great. Okay. Excellent. 
So let's move into our next category, uh, and that is uh, what skills are needed by a data scientist. So I think that we've got kind of two aspects of this. So what skills are needed and then what training? So uh, I think the way that we have kind of flowed this presentation is answering the two questions at the same time. Sure. So is this an appropriate slide? Should we start here? Yes, this is very appropriate. Great. And this slide is really not intended for someone to read through from top left to the bottom right. Well, that's good uh, because I can't. I don't know if anyone else can. <laughs> um, so so I, I think the point I wanted to get across with this slide is that the scope is very wide and deep. And what do I mean by that is data science, and you will see in the forward slides as well, is that data science is really the 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 symphony, if you will, the, the symphony is probably a loaded word, um, but it is a mutual uh, uh, consensus between three three units. One of them is the business, the other is the technology, the third is the science. And so what I have on the left-hand side is the scope of the business problems that we usually try to address. Now, they're still actually articulated in technical terms, and I apologize for that. But really what we're trying to do is actually collect data and draw data-driven insights, you know, optimize our data uh, royalty rates, for example, deduplications, you know, automate some of these uh, decisions and so on and so forth. So on the left-hand side, you see the kind of use cases that data scientists usually deal with from a business perspective. From a technology perspective, the top right corner that you see there is that we deal with a variety of data. You know, when I say variety of data, it comes unstructured, it comes semi-structured, it comes structured. And not all analytics are the same. In some cases, you're actually trying to do forecasting, which typically means you're doing temporal analysis, time-based analysis. In some other cases, for example, you're, you're looking to do conjoint analysis, you know, hey, which feature is selling most to our customers? In those cases, you might actually want to do regression. Uh, in some other cases, you're doing customer segmentation, looking to, to optimize your messaging to the customers that will likely buy your product upfront, given your field sales calls are very limited, for example. In that case, you're doing clustering. The point I'm trying to get across there is that depending on the nature of the problem, the kind of data that you have at your disposal, the data can be coming in very fast in a variety of formats and so on. You should be willing to deal with, no matter what kind of data comes at you, at whatever speed, you should be able to deal with it um, uh, from, from a technology perspective. The third, and the one that's actually, uh, you know, that most of the data scientists really first gravitate to is the statistical skills. Um, and typically people go through the same CRISPM process of collecting data, curating data, exploring this data, formulating a model, uh, validating this model and scoring a model and applying this cyclically, if you will, to understand what is the maximal return that you can get from this data, if you will. So as you're actually doing that, you know, the variety of analytics, like I've said, uh, that, I, that you see going down uh, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, you can look at it like a life cycle that happens where you're acquiring data, and modeling it and ultimately scoring it at the other end. Um, so there's a variety of statistical skills as well that you have to develop in a sense. The summary of this slide is not for you to actually uh, remember all of these terms, only the fact that, um, and no one becomes a real data scientist, by the way, overnight or even possibly after 10 years, which by the way, I'm not a real data scientist, even today I'm a hack. But the point I'm trying to get across is that Well, the don't tell the audience because they're <laughs> listening because they want to listen to a real data scientist. <laughs> very, very journey. humble of you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. So, so there's always more to learn, right? I mean, we all have to acknowledge the fact that the, the, the field is very wide and very deep and that all of us have, uh, you know, the, should have that humility actually to acknowledge that we, we know little and we have more to learn in a sense, but the scope is very wide and very deep. Mm -hmm. yeah, for so sure. if you don't mind moving to the next slide, I do have a, yeah. a little bit better breakdown on what it is that you absolutely need. Great. At the bottom right corner, um, there's a Dr. Drew Conway, who actually, I, I think, is a very beautiful representation of what a data scientist mm -hmm. really needs. They need to be very good at software. They need to be uh, a better software engineer than, uh, than, for example, a statistical analyst. I, someone said this beautifully, and I wish I could find that quote. And they need to be a better statistician than a software engineer, for example, and things of that nature. But the point of that particular Venn diagram you see is that the data scientist trifecta requires that you actually have so good software skills. So if you have a hypothesis about something, you don't mind digging into the data and immediately implementing that in whatever language of your choice is. Python, R, Jump, SAS, Java, whatever it is that really makes you comfortable. 
be able to actually tinker with data and try out those hypotheses very quickly. So you absolutely need software skills. And I, I believe what Dr. Drew Conway calls it hacking skills, but to me it's software skills, ability to quickly try something. You need to have statistical knowledge. You know, when I say statistical knowledge, let me not send a wrong message that you need to have a PhD in statistics. Not at all. It's a, actually, it's quite the contrary. You need to be able to understand exactly what, what the nature of the data is. Um, I won't bore you too much, but there is this thing called normality distributions, you know, central limit theorems, and so on and so forth. So you need to know how, if your data's grain, if your data's distribution, and so on, are not violating some of these normative assumptions that we make in the real world. And you should be able to tell that. And you, you, you don't tell that because you have a PhD in statistics. You, you're able to actually study, you know, bounds such as, you know, age, for example, shouldn't be beyond 20 to 80 in your business domain, for example. You know, that doesn't need a PhD in uh, statistics, but you should be able to understand that there are these real world conditions that need to be applied, and you should be smart enough to actually weed some of these outliers out. That is the fundamental statistical skill that any data scientist would actually need. The third and uh, often overlooked is the business skills. Like I said, you know, I was actually faking till, faking it till I made it. Uh, there's a great book called Fake It Till You Make It. Uh, like I said, in 2010, when I was faking for those three months to be a real data scientist, not knowing really, you know, what I was looking for in the data, you need to actually have the business uh, expertise, you know, understand what is the purposeful investigation that you're really trying to solve for. And so a data scientist needs to be a combination of software, statistics, and business to succeed. Um, so, so if you don't mind, you know, I think the other things, I'm going to ignore the statistical, the heuristic skills, and sure. which we've already covered. You need to deal with big data. That's just the harsh reality of today. You know, yeah. you, you're, you're not dealing with siloed databases anymore. It's very, you are collecting data at a very big, fast pace. You need to be able to actually be savvy in big data. Where you're collocating all this data into a data lake and are able to actually draw insights out of it. And I can't stress enough, all of us actually can use the communication skills, the visualization skills, the leadership skills. Uh, in a sense, you could be the greatest data scientist in the world, and, and we know if you actually right here in the San Francisco area. Um, if you cannot really digest, uh, make this, communicate, the analysis that you've done, the insight that you've drawn to your key stakeholders that is digestible from their viewpoint, if you will, I think we have tremendously failed. Mm -hmm. So you could be the best scientist, but if you're not able to articulate that into, into something that they can palate to, then we have failed. And so communication skills are very, very, very important, and I myself am learning that skill as we go along. Um, visualization skills are important. You do not want to articulate a story through a spreadsheet. You do not want to articulate a story through, say, you know, uh, complex uh, data screens or matrices on the screen. Rather, you want to be able to present summarized findings in, in rich, powerful visualizations. So your customers are actually consuming some of these insights perceptually first, more so than cognitively. And obviously, when the interest peaks is when their perceptive skills will switch over into the cognitive skills. But you got to be able to actually have those skills to actually present visualizations in a very compelling manner. Third is leadership skills, and we'll come back to that in the next slide. But the point is, you need to be able to actually be willing to take the risk and lead the way by educating others on your viewpoints, uh, and often standing down by disagreeing and committing as well. But you need to actually exhibit the leadership traits as you go along. Okay, and finally. Uh, you need to actually be a lean startup champion. What do I mean by that is, at least 1990s and uh, you know early 2000s, perhaps research science as it was being done, the the appetite for failure was obviously less because uh, you know labs were required, if you will, to to explore new ideas and succeed at them, even if that meant long tenure research into it. In data science, that's not to say you don't have the same discipline or regimen into it but you should be willing to actually try quickly and be willing to fail and celebrate that failure and iterate on that success very uh, quickly. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching uh, what is obviously very obvious, but in data science, at least in the new 2010, you know, the millennial domains, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. this very quick lean startup mentality is absolutely necessary. Um, from it. a skills so perspective- fail, Failing fast. Failing fast, yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Failing fast. 
Uh, and then, uh, you know, people typically ask me, how do I become a data scientist? You know, I always tell them, um, uh, sure, you know, there are a bunch of online classes, there's online leagues, championship leagues, rather, mm -hmm. contests like Kaggle and so on that you can participate in. Uh, tons of online material that you can draw in, and you can network through Silicon Valley Data Science, the meetups in your local chapters, for example. There are a lot of online graduate programs that you can actually take, and they're all very, very good. Um, there's tons of tools now. Previously, we didn't have all of these tools unless you, you know, uh, you went with SAS or SPSS and so on. Now, you know, tools like Pandas, R, Escalo, and Spark, they're all available at this point in time for us to actually immediately download and start tinkering with these things, with these data sets. But there is no surrogate. Let me start, go back to the left-hand side here of what I was trying mm -hmm. to say. There is no surrogate for hands-on data science. Going to Kaggles, going to online courses might teach you the academic under, underpinnings of your science. Absolutely, you should know that. But there is nothing better. You forget. If you don't practice, you forget. And so there's no surrogate for real hands-on experience. And that is, in fact, where most people struggle to find a real use case that they can apply these data science skills to. What I'm really saying is start with an enterprise data science use case. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by enterprise data science? You know, hey, say a customer is calling you and you collect all these service management calls. Uh, that data is available, and obviously you want to mitigate the burden rate on your customer call centers, for example. That's an enterprise use case. Say a lot of people are actually logging into VPN and stealing information, you know, you want to basically prevent uh, this um, uh, extrication of sensitive data, and so IT collects all of these logs. Start with something that you can actually, you have friends with in your enterprise, where you can solicit this data and provide some real-time value within your own enterprise. So you're not really doing a product data science. You're not really doing, if you will, a new business product and so on, or business value. Uh, and an enterprise cleanup data science use case is a wonderful way to get your feet wet. Great. Excellent. Well, let's take a couple of questions here. Um, I might, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to go ahead and, and ask this anyway. Um, we've got a question that says, is it compulsory to have an IT-based knowledge or skill to be a data scientist? Or is it more to it to teamwork between business and IT? Excellent question. And I'm going to actually defer that question until we hit the next slide. Uh, it is actually a combination. It's not a singular. Um, it is not a singular plane of uh, a skill that you need to acquire. Got it. Okay. So I have one more question, and you might defer this one too, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is it possible to graduate into a data scientist role, or do you need an apprenticeship in other disciplines first? Oh, that's a good one. Certainly, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think uh, graduate. I mean, if you're really talking about an academic graduation, uh, then no. The answer is no. You can't. Uh, it, it's like this. I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I'm a human factors engineer by training. But I'm a data scientist, right? So in that sense, it's not an academic degree that gets you there. I, and I don't think that's what the questioner really meant. Mm -hmm. uh, do you kind of ease into where it is that wherever you are, do you graduate forward into a data science role? I think that is the most appropriate answer, yes. You don't yeah. go inventing new problems. You don't go actually, uh, you know, um, uh, go change your role for that. You know, I'm sure there are plenty of problems within your current role, wherever it is that you are, whether you are in IT, whether you're in financial analysis, supply chain analysis, manufacturing, customer care, sales and marketing, whatever it is, that role that you are in. I'm sure there's a problem, a standing problem, and you have a data set that actually will articulate the problem at you. Uh, try and solve it from there itself. Now, to doing the apprentice, I think that is also very important. You can absolutely take an apprentice, but not at the expense of leaving what it is that you currently have. Um, is something I would recommend against, frankly, because I think then you're really starting off from trying to learn a new business domain as well, and that I wouldn't recommend. You have plenty of problems in your existing domain, I suppose. Great. Okay, good. And then last question in this category, and then we'll go on to the next group of slides. Is it required to take the Hadoop developer learning path to work towards becoming a data scientist? Um, yes and no, and uh, Hadoop would... Uh, I usually don't take technology calls, but in order to be brief, so we can actually advance to the next slides. Yes, Hadoop is the right technology, but uh, right um, architecture, I would say. Uh, but I would really focus, if you're really getting into the big data, I would focus more on the Spark side of things versus the MapReduce programming and so on. Got it. Okay, great. Well, let's go to the next set of slides. So 
Uh, we'll go to this next category, and then we are going to talk about the teamwork again. So again, my poorly worded question, apologies. Mm -hmm. To whom do data scientists report? <laughs> All right. Sure. So I want you guys to read, uh, you know, this, uh, and there's a, there's a problem, right? And, and I'm trying to describe the problem here. So, so Dilbert's manager says we have a gigantic database full of customer behavior. Excellent, we can use nonlinear math and data mining technology to optimize our retail channels. And that's the Dilbert saying it. So the techie in Dilbert is saying it, and then the pointy head manager is saying something else. Um, really, I think the, 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 the highlight of that particular uh, you know, image or, or the picture is that's exactly the challenge that all of us face today. The business has a certain need and they think they have data to solve the problem, and they go to the technology to actually get that problem solved. Technology has their own nomenclature, their own protocols and DevOps and processes that they follow in, the, in order to actually extract this data and make things happen. And at least in the, in the old world, what, what, what they did was, you know, there was, uh, and I call this the dissonance of data science, as you can see at the bottom corner, is the business, the technology, and the science that we see uh, are three competing uh, vectors of every enterprise. Uh, small or big, it's a different question, but there is absolutely the dissonance where the business wants very quick decisions and they want very agile business strategies to be implemented. And the technology wants to make sure that they're actually still going through the quote-unquote security and the privacy compliance, the governance, the DevOps, and so on and so forth. And finally, in between all of this trash, we have people that really are very, very smart, the science geeks, if you will, the data ninjas, that sit there trying to figure out, you know, where exactly are we going because they can't really deal with this trash, if you will. And what I'm really trying to tell here is that that dissonance exists in every enterprise and it's a data sciences, scientist's responsibility to make sure that there's a common nomenclature and a common viewpoint, if you will, that's reached uh, to drive the harmony towards business, technology, and science. As such, they have to deal with a lot of uh, different people within uh, the company, uh, right from the very top, the CXOs, the CEO, the chief operating officer, and so on, all the way to the database administrators. Now, that's not, I'm not suggesting that there's a hierarchy here, right? I'm not trying to say the database administrators do uh, you know, any lowly work than what a CXO does, but the point is it's broad the data scientist has to touch every one of these personas to understand and drive a common nomenclature between business, technology, and science. So to go back to the question that someone asked, you know, should you be in IT? Um, no, not quite at all, actually. Uh, uh, it's great that you actually are sitting on one of these wings, these uh, uh, flanks or flanges, mm -hmm. um, to actually you know, be able to already establish the trust, if you will, with your partners in the organization but it's much better if you actually bring this combinatorial knowledge, your business relationships, your technology relationships, and most importantly, your academic uh, clarity to the table than you would otherwise bring with sim simple singular point of view. So, so again, to, to answer your question, Kelly, very specifically, because the data scientists need to drive the synergy between these three uh, you know, factions, faction mm -hmm. is probably an overloaded word, but you know, these, these three uh, clans, we basically have sit currently conveniently under solutions architecture teams. So whenever there's a business problem that has already gone through uh, a justification scenario, an exploration scenario, that is when data scientists currently engage, although that's not the right model. Um, but currently we report into solutions architecture group, we report into the technology groups and so on. Here is where my viewpoint also comes, by the way, and this is my viewpoint. Mm -hmm. is every enterprise or every organization that we have worked with, and you can relate with your own domains here, is ha they, there is always a chief product officer or a chief strategy officer that's trying to advance the business vision forward. Every organization has one. Then there's a chief data officer that usually assumes the, 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 the governance role, if you will, on ensuring mm -hmm. that the data is actually adequately maintained and and the technology is following the right processes and protocols like I've said before. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you don't notice a chief analytics officer, and that's my pet peeve with the industry today. Not that I'm qualified to actually comment about the industry, but I think it would be great if companies realize that there absolutely needs to be a champion for propagating science as well across the entire organization. 
So there needs to be a chief analytics officer uh, in order for companies to really realize the value of data science. We are seeing a little bit of that. I, you know, in following the rise of the chief data officer, we're seeing a little bit of that. But I think you're absolutely right. I think that 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 role of the analytics officer to assist with this dissonance at the most senior level of sponsorship is really critical. I mean, I think you know you brought up a very good point around the dissonance as it particularly um, pertains to privacy, right? And using that data. Um, that has a very hard cost to organizations if there are mistakes or or gaffes that occur, you know, exactly. with that. So I think that's a really good perspective. Exactly. So one of the questions that came in, and then I'll let you get back to, to your slide, is as a data scientist, do well, do you have or who is your ideal non-scientist partner on the business side? and what critical skills or strengths should they have or should they cultivate? Ah, that's a, that's a good one. I think um, it, it is definitely the solutions architect would be, uh, would be my favorite uh, person to actually associate with uh, because they actually bring that end-to-end -end viewpoint that a data scientist absolutely needs. Um, so, so they could be actually be your champion of the cause of avoiding this FUD and the dissonance, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that mm -hmm. each of these mm -hmm. you know, business technology and science partners have mm -hmm. uh, because they're participating in the meetings right from the beginning of the exploration phases all the way to the execution stages. I think they would be the best partners that you can actually make. Now, mind you, I think they could be looking up to your partnership as well, just as valued as you would otherwise. So I think you should assume uh, that collaborative relationship, and it's a give and take, basically, in, in that relationship going forward. Um, and and you shouldn't be ha you shouldn't be afraid actually to to quell some of that fud that has um, arisen in the industry uh, a little bit. You know, with the big data, for example, you know, a lot of people MapReduce was great for information extraction, so Google and Facebook, for example, could use that to a great effect. But when a lot of these companies saw that, you know, hey, Hadoop is very cheap, we can go buy a bunch of machines and put our data in it, they wanted to build a data warehouse out of uh, big data. Now, I'll get back to the question, really. But it, what happened is they were really, so the CEC, the chief information officers and so on of the companies were expecting Hadoop to basically give you pretty dashboards, uh, you know, SQL dialects, and all of this quote-unquote in-memory advanced analytics on your data lakes. The expectation of what the, company, the, the product was built for or, or the technology could enable and the business expectation of what it could actually deliver uh, failed. And therefore, there was some hyperbole about this big data and so on that happened. What I'm right. really trying to get to here is that data science, in order to not fall perils to the same kind of hyperbole, we have a responsibility to make sure that there's a good level setting that happens, good education that happens across all echelons of the organization that there is realistic expectations and you actually prove the value by applied data science. So sit close to your best friends in solutions architecture. Okay, think mm -hmm. of, sit close to your technology partners to actually grapple with the data hands-on. Sit close to their business stakeholders by not simply preaching to them, but rather showing them. So show and tell, you know. Uh, put your money where your mouth is kind of a deal. And so that's exactly, exactly what we have to be doing uh, day in, day out in order for us to be successful as data scientists in this world. Great, great. So one more question, and then we're going to get to your last uh, couple of slides, which I'd like to get to because I think they're really compelling. Um, do you have any advice for an organization that wants to start a department uh, working on data science or working with data science? Uh, yes and no. So hire a chief analytics officer. Right? Okay, that good. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to you don't want to kind of you know you you want to have you want to be you will see some of this you know explore educate engage kind of excite and stuff mm -hmm. like uh, things happen, but you do not want to sign something up with or with 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 um, a hypothesis, right? I mean that you know there will absolutely be value at the end. So I think there is some precursory education that needs to happen within uh, any organization. And mm -hmm. I think the chief analytics officer should be chartered to actually driving some of that, mm -hmm. uh, the prescriptive, predictive, preemptive insights that the data science confers to the companies. I think they, they, they should champion that cause first. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, great. 
Now this next section uh, I'd like to get through and then we'll uh, wrap up by taking any final questions that have come through. So where is data science headed in the future? Awesome, this is actually my favorite. Uh, <laughs> <that's>, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think uh, in, if I may basically summarize this, uh, the industry is headed where deep learning is become, becoming the norm. Uh, is inherently an expectation of every data scientist to know. Um, so before I define what deep learning or, or, or kind of tease you about what deep learning is, let me tell you why I say that. And uh, the same very Tom Davenport, you know, I respect him, um, you know, very much. Uh, he defines this kind of analytics 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 3.0, 4.0, 4.0 .0 being the deep learning or the cognitive learning uh, phase of uh, analytics. Um, so, so what I want to do is paint a picture as to how it looked in the past. Uh, in the past, we had user 1.0, data 1.0, and technology 1.0. What do I mean by that is there were specific personas or, or roles dis, you know, designed to doing traditional things. Like for example, there was a financial analyst, there was an operations research analyst, uh, there was a you know a supply chain analyst, for example. So they had enough statistical skills and enough data management skills in order to actually look at their domain and be able to um, uh, analyze that uh, analyze the data set. Um, so to each their own is the best way of putting it, where, where there was a technology guy, a science guy, a business guy, uh, and each had their own favorite tools, if you will, that they would actually use. The data was also very scattered. You know, we had data marts. We didn't have data lakes. We didn't have big data warehouses and so on. We had data marts where sales data would be in one database, marketing data would be in another database, and sales and marketing folks don't really talk. Um, similarly, we, we had uh, you know behavioral analytics data in some other place, transactional data in some other place. So very siloed, uh, distributed, dispersed data sets. The technology also was very dispersed, meaning there were some people that were absolutely in love with SaaS. There were some other people that absolutely love their Power BI's and Cognos tools and SPSS tools, for example. And they, they warred at each other, you know, because they would be so wed with the technology and the tool that they never really talk to each other. I think what is happening now is that we are seeing evolution of users 2.0, data 2.0, and technology 2.0. What I mean by that is we are able to coagulate all of these scattered data sets into a single data lake, semi-structured, structured, unstructured at various velocities, at various complex event models together in a singular logical data warehouse because of the big data environment, Spark, Hadoop, and so on. Now we also have technology where you can run some in-place analytics, meaning you don't necessarily have to extricate the data from your SQL Server database, for example, and take it to your jump tool in order to run a regression model. Some of these analytics are becoming in-database analytics where you can apply the regression model right there on your schema, on your table, in place. But most importantly, the users are getting power personas, meaning they are now assuming a hybrid role of becoming a data scientist, understanding the business persona, ability to do the data explorations, the shaping, the imputations, and so on themselves. As this transformation is happening, I think that is in fact, the user 2.0 is really the data scientist, okay? But long story, what I'm trying to tell you is, all of these models that we learned, the machine learning, where we were trying to apply the explainability, the palatability kind of principles to our analysis, the trigger, has been thrown out the door with the, with the rise of deep learning. For those of you that are keeping in touch, the self-driving cars that we see, the Google map driving instruction, written, you know, things that we see, the Google Home appliance or Amazon Alexa appliance that we see, where a machine is able to actually sense human sensory stimuli, like speech and uh, and able to play games like Go, for example, and, and chess, for example, are all possible because of a technology called neural networks. And these neural networks, unfortunately, you know, don't give you any explainability. A neural network can associate a pattern, an action, with a data pattern it sees. But exactly if you ask a neural network how it came about doing that association and what the inference is, it cannot do it. But who cares? I think the point I'm trying to get across here is the machines have become so good at image categorization and they have, good, have become so good at detecting human stimuli, sensory stimuli, and predicting outcomes from it, even so far as driving a car completely unautomated, uh, automated, unattended, is awesome. And the deep learning skills are absolutely necessary for you to succeed in the next four to five years, in my opinion. 
So I'm not saying throw away the machine learning uh, that you've learned. I'm not saying throw away all the data preparation skills that you've learned. They are very important for you to still hold on to those, those uh, the scientific and the academic rigor that you've learned, but also embrace these new, non-explainable, deep learning capabilities that the industry is bracing itself to be. I mean, it sounds like fundamentally this is an ongoing learning process, and we are still very much in a dynamic industry where as soon as we think we've learned something or we think we've mastered something, then something else comes up <laughs> that we need to do, to look at to build on top of that previously mastered skill. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Very but, 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 but again, yeah, I think there's one subtle thing, I don't know if I got that across, is at least for me, if I may speak from a, from a personal point of view here, it's very hard for an academic, and I am an academic mm -hmm. by the way, that mm -hmm. wants to understand how an algorithm is behaving. Mm -hmm. um, because I want to be able to explain that if someone should ask me, mm -hmm. uh, and it bothered the heck out of me that I was not able to do that with these neural networks, these convolutional neural networks or recurrent neural networks, and mm -hmm. so on. It bothered the heck out of me. But I think I've come away with the feeling that maybe it's not meant for me to understand, right? Again, I don't mean to get, uh, uh, get into theology here, but mm -hmm. uh, fact is, it works. The yeah. dang thing, excuse the language, it actually uh -huh. works. And uh -huh. so what I'm really realizing is that maybe it's not meant for me to understand, just the fact that I have enough knowledge to be able to grapple with these modules that are already out in the open source domain that Google is putting out through TensorFlow, mm -hmm. Facebook is putting out with their Facebook artificial intelligence research, Microsoft mm -hmm. is putting out, IBM is putting out, you know, maybe it's for me to just kind of download this, tinker, be very hands-on, and apply a real problem like self-driving, image categorization, you know, subtitling a video, for example. Let's just apply and see how it works. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want other people to embrace as well. Don't get philosophically too stuck on that uh, regimen or, or, or the theory that you absolutely need to understand everything. Not everything needs to be explainable. There are some advances where you just have to learn by doing, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, versus just being stuck with the academic theory, I guess, is the point I want to try. That's great. That's great. That's, that's good. I think there's a lot of people on the line who want to uh, figure out the how of everything, so I think that's good guidance. So just a couple more questions. We've got three minutes left. Sure. For someone who's not coming from a statistical mathematical background, would it be tough to make progress on the deep learning technologies domain? Not at all. It's quite the contrary. Like I was saying, it's not the academic knowledge that's my important. Mm -hmm. It's the hands-on uh, hacking hacking skills that are very important. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, statistics has never bothered me. I, I, as a matter of fact, in 2010, I didn't know what a zeta. I, I knew what a normal distribution, what a z test was. But if you ask me today, do I think about it daily? In no, I don't. You know, they're all they're all fundamental principles you learn, mm -hmm. uh, but they're they're not inhibitors for you to actually succeed in this domain. Got it. Okay, great. So last question. So can you elaborate a bit more on the business analyst, which is the what, versus the data analyst, which looks at the why? So you made this statement early on when you're looking at what is a, a data scientist and how is that different from other roles that existed in the pre in uh, an organization. So with a data scientist thinking about the why as opposed to a business analyst thinking about the what. Mm -hmm. And the direction of the question is trying to understand what are some of the key behavior differences that you would you that you would identify to delineate uh, between the two. Sure, I, I think um, uh, data analysts are very close surrogates of data scientists. Mm -hmm. I, I, the, the only difference I, I I tend to make there are two actually, like I was saying, is. Um, ability to actually apply this in on in the live data context, if you will. Not that data analysts don't do it, they do it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. data analysts are typically dealing with, uh, you know, data sets or structured data sets that already have been defined or have been identified as in where the problem's solution or problem itself exists. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas a data scientist does not, has enough skills rather, to be able to directly dig into these live streams these big data sets, if you will, to extrapolate the theory, that hypothesis that you have as a data analyst, and write it out on the real data as well. And that, I think, is, uh, is, that, is that why aspect. It's a scalable why, one. Mm -hmm. And two, they're also trying what if theories. You know, what mm -hmm. if. Uh, meaning, you know, they're not afraid to actually construct um, champion challenger scenarios, where, where they're doing A-B experimentation to see exactly what kind of lifts or what kind of 
optimizations they're able to actually achieve by effectuating a change that is uh, commensurate with the hypothesis that they've actually postulated. So it's very similar. I think the, the distinction can be very, very uh, close, but mm -hmm. it's also the what if scenarios that the data scientist is willing to play with and the big data that they're able, we're able to apply this with. Okay, great. So last question. I know that it's the top of the hour, but this is a quick one and I think it's, it'll be interesting. What are the tools for deep learning? Is IBM Watson one of those tools? Could you pick a winner? So I know that's uh, a big question, but quick answer. <laughs> I won't pick a winner. IBM oh, Watson oh. is not deep learning, by the way. Oh, there data. we go. <laughs> <laughs> and the winner really is, uh, there are many, uh, Cafe, Torch, Theano, TensorFlow, Deep Learning 4J, and so on. But I think what you should really focus on is Keras. There's a library called Keras, K-E-R-A-S, that is able to abstract the implementation from the interface. So Keras, you can actually plug and play a different deep learning algorithm behind, but mm -hmm. you would not have to rewrite your implement uh, your algorithm really. Um, it's all plug and play in a sense. So I would, if you're really confused which tool to pick, I would definitely pick K E R A S. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Narasim Shannon. Back to you. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you so much, Narasimha, for joining us and, and giving us a great insight into what it is to be a data scientist. I know, uh, and thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and asking such great questions throughout the presentation. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording uh, of the presentation, and get all that information out to you along with additional contact information so you can continue the conversation. And so I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks to all. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Much. Take care. Bye.